um, to see and say things up. To everyone who is joining us from the various places you are, um, both virtually as the, in the Zoom world and on Facebook, um, greetings on behalf of everyone, my colleague Karen and myself at Elliott Bay Book Company, which is on Duwamish land in the city of Seattle. We are delighted to be um, playing things close to home tonight in terms of the region, in terms of the Northwest, as we present two books um, recently published by Perfect Day Publishers out of, uh, per Perfect Day Books out of Portland, um, a press, an independent press that's been around for a decade. And tonight you will hear from three authors of these two books. You will hear um, on, from this wonderful book, Loners, uh, The Making of a Street Library, both Ben Hodgson and um, who will also be known as Hodge as we go through the evening and Laura Moulton. And you will also be hearing um, from Martha Grover, who is the author of S Sorry I Was Gone, uh, which is um, a third memoir. Um, these three writers are all in Portland as is Perfect Day Books. So it's a it's a, a just down the way from Seattle or up, you know, we're up there way from them evening. And um, we're delighted to be doing this. Um, I'm, I could say more about both books and I will say, I guess I will say a little bit more, but making this all happen in all sorts of ways, both the actual books and the evening itself will be Michael Heald, who is the publisher of Perfect Day Books, the editor for both books. And um, in the case of Martha Grover, I believe this is the third time um, um, that he and Martha have collaborated um, in Martha's work getting published. So um, Perfect Day Books is a press that's it's one of the wonderful independent presses of this region um, that's been around a decade and has been doing um, some really um, marvelous work. You will tonight be hearing from two of the, those marvelous works. Um, and I guess I'll, before I turn this over to Michael, mm -hmm. um, Karen is putting information in the chat. Obviously, she's been encouraging you to put in your comments. We hope you'll keep putting comments in, um, including questions as we go through, because near the end of the program, Michael will work questions into the, your questions into the conversation. Um, you will hear um, Hodge and uh, Laura Moulton talk about their book, Loners. And, and um, first, once Michael sets this up, he'll actually introduce all these. And then uh, Martha will be reading from Sorry I Was Gone. Then Michael will ask them all some questions. And that's probably the part where if you have questions, um, he will work those in as well. Um, and then Karen will also be putting information on these books, which are on display um, and in Elliott Bay, probably in some bookstores in Portland and some other places too. But um, we hope you'll, you'll um, support the work of Perfect Day Books, especially in uh, because um, Bookstores like ours love selling in, you know, putting independently published books in people's hands. And tonight is a night about books, especially as you will hear um, as loners get talked about the passion and um, motivations behind um, what Laura Moulton's done with uh, street books in Portland and um, um, Hodge's part in the life of that project. And that, that um, it's actually an institution now in Portland, it's decade old also. So um, again, for everyone at Elliott Bay, I'm gonna now disappear and um, I will come back at the very end, but um, say you're in good hands. Um, first, those of Michael Heald. So uh, to everyone though, uh, Martha Grover, uh, Ben Hodgson and Laura Moulton um, and Michael Heald, please give your good virtual attention and applause now. And Michael, it's yours to take over. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Rick. Um, thanks for the kind words and thanks to Karen and Elliott Bay for hosting us tonight. Um, I, I should just uh, quickly um, clarify that I don't deserve any credit for Sorry I Was Gone, Martha's new book. Uh, she, it's one of the things we'll be talking about in our conversation, but she uh, self-released it and it's available through a great uh, zine distro called Antiquated Future, as Karen mentioned in the chat. But I did work on, with Martha on her first two books and um, she's one of my favorite writers. And so it just was a natural pairing with uh, the loners crew. Um, so we were going to start with a couple of readings. Uh, Laura and, and Hodge are going to read from Loners, and um, I'm really excited about what they're going to read tonight because the book alternates points of view. Um, it's a pretty unique experience to read this book uh, because some of the sections are very short, as you're, you're about to, to hear, 
And this is kind of the first time I think we're going to get to see in public, like the book be enacted as it kind of feels on the page uh, with the back and forth quality. So Laura and Hodge are going to read now and then Martha will read after and then we'll have uh, a talk. Um, thanks so much for being here, everybody. I'm going to go first. Thanks so much, everyone, for coming. And um, thanks for having us, Elliot Bay. Um, this first little section, we're going to do a couple of um, maybe th three or four uh, back and forths, but they're just a page long each. Um, this first section that I'll read is called The First Shift. It was gray and misty the morning I pedaled the bike library on its maiden voyage. The Regional Arts and Culture Council had come through with a grant and I'd used part of the money to buy a used Haley trike from Craigslist. It was a simple plywood box on wheels, but James had painted it, James is my brother, a sea blue color, added stained trim and stenciled street books on each side. He'd also built a drawer inside that would pull out from the front, enabling me to display the books. To make sure it was level, James had set a bag of chicken feed inside it and taken it for a test drive in my neighborhood it didn't tip over even when he took a sharp turn. I carried titles I'd culled from my own shelves, The Monkey Wrench Gang, a copy of Portland Noir, and a handful of the Louis L'Amour Westerns I'd inherited from my grandfather when he died. I'd also hit a used bookstore to stock up on some Stephen King, James Patterson, Nora Roberts, and others. Pedaling along, I watched for people with big backpacks or pieces of cardboard under them, sitting against buildings and in the doorways of businesses not yet open. As I kept an eye out for those who seemed weather beaten, it struck me that I'd been conditioned for years to avert my eyes from people who were living outside, pushing a shopping cart or just waking up on the sidewalk. Now I was doing the opposite. I actively looked for and hoped to find them. Now over to you, Hodge. Uh, ben, hi, this is, I'm Ben. Uh, this is uh, the very next page flying signs. I wasn't crazy exactly, but had a diminished capacity from depression. Sick is a good word for it, and creepy, helpless, pathetic, contemptible. I was a regular walking thesaurus, a litany of mental health issues. Riding on the bus, trying not to sit too close to anyone, hunched inside myself as close as I could squeeze, which was completely ineffective as a prophylactic measure, but the best I could come up with under the circumstances. The first few weeks being outside, I suffered alienation from the people I'd left behind, as well as from the outdoorsmen I encountered on the street. I was also paranoid. The man on the bus was not staring at me but I was pretty sure he was. <clears throat> Do we see a pattern emerging here? Let's review. I had finding a bathroom anxiety, riding a bus anxiety, finding a place to sleep anxiety, getting a seat anxiety, wet feet anxiety. Most mental health professionals will confirm that depression and anxiety kind of go hand in hand. Some would agree that with serious long-term depression, psychosis is just around the corner. Or was that it around the last corner? I don't really understand that stuff. What I do know is that things can get pretty weird. But for those who are handling it well enough, being outdoors is not as pitiful as we fear it will be. One can adapt to nearly anything. One could also go nearly nuts from the shock of it before making the adjustment. I wasn't one to fly a fan handling sign, but one I would have tried is Vietnam vet still crazy after that one year. Found some sidewalk space up in the pearl for a while. The sidewalks are just a little softer there. The spare change a little jinglier but it turns out you have to bring designer cardboard with you or the other homeless people look down on you. Imagine the snooty nasal drone. Frankly, it was embarrassing, the cardboard that those people were sleeping on. 
funny thought that some of the homeless do look down on other homeless people. It must be some sort of basic human need to be able to look down on someone. And homeless people serve an important function in society. We give everybody someone else to look down on. Maybe we should start charging for that. It was, in fact, the only sign I ever flew for about 10 minutes. Feel superior to me for five minutes, 35 cents. All day pass, $3. I didn't get any change, but I did get a laugh. Be the spare change you want to see in my world. Never flew that one either. The second shift. The next week, it was still misty and cool as I set up the library alongside Skidmore Fountain. There were police officers on horses posing for pictures with a gaggle of elementary school children. One kid could not get over the horses and kept reaching up as if to hug one around the neck over the protestations of his teacher. After the students lined up and followed their teacher away, the officers roused a row of people along the fountain where they slept, hedged in by shopping carts covered in blue tarp, a tangle of clothing and bedding and arms. I watched as they groggily assembled their belongings. A young man in white stocking feet stared blankly at the bike library and then went back to stuffing his gear into a plastic bag. My first customer of the day was a man wearing red horn-rimmed glasses and a beard on the edge of feral. His hair grew just past his collar and were he to trade his shabby gray coat for a tweed jacket and his brown paper bag for a leather briefcase, it would have been easy enough to imagine him at the lectern of a university classroom. By now, the sun had burned off the mist and the day was warm. Come have a look at the books, I said. I'm running a free library. You check them out and then return them the next week, same time, same place. GQ. At first, she looked like any other street librarian, complete with the cards in the books and post-it notes and paper clips, bicycle park, and little shelf pulled out displaying the collection. I graciously overlooked the complete lack of any Woodhouse titles on her shelves, but did mention in passing that a well-maintained library does require some attention. Only too late would I learn that here was a teacher turned a recalcitrant school child that refuses to do her assigned reading, but I didn't know that yet. I'd arrived in my ratty looking coat, scruffy beard, hair going every which way, like I just stepped off the cover of Gentleman's Quarterly and then into a threshing machine. The way I must have looked to Laura at the street library, it could easily have been straight out of Woodhouse, describing one of Bertie's lovesick acquaintances, he writes. He looked like a character in one of those Russian novels, trying to decide whether to murder several relatives before hanging himself in the barn. Okay, this is the last little section I'll read. Travels with Charlie. The man in the glasses looked carefully through the titles, picking up a book and studying the back, then tucking it back onto the shelf. I wouldn't know whether to enlighten myself or just get something to kill the afternoon, he said. I balanced a stack of paperbacks on the corner of the box and put, this, put a street book sticker on the bottom right corner of each one. Something told me that this person could be easily scared away if I gave him my full attention, so I busied myself with the books. In the end, he chose Ian Levison's Dog Eats Dog, a satirical crime novel about a wounded bank robber who blackmails a history professor. He also checked out Travels with Charlie by John Steinbeck. The former book lacked any mention of a real dog, but in the latter, Steinbeck's poodle is his travel companion. It's a story of an epic 1960 road trip in which Steinbeck and his dog go in search of America. Steinbeck describes the diners where he ate and the conversations he had with everyday Americans. It also explores the ways it can be lonesome out on the road. I'm Laura, I said, and stuck out my hand. The man shook it and said, Ben Hodgson, I wrote his name on the street books library card and gave it to him. Okay, then he said. He gave a faint smile and a shrug, then turned and headed for the waterfront. <laughs> Thank you for the virtual applause, Michael. <laughs> that was great. 
Uh, thank you so much for, for indulging me. And um, I think that's such a great introduction to the book too. Uh, just that special, really a unique moment that we get to see from both points of view. Um, and uh, we'll come back, of course, to loners, but um, I want to uh, introduce, uh, well, uh, have Martha read from Sorry I Was Gone. Um, and then uh, we'll definitely have time. So if anybody has questions that are uh, starting to, to boil up inside your brains, um, please put them in the Q&A or in the chat. We're keeping an eye on all that. But um, without further ado, uh, Martha is going to be reading from her brand new book, Sorry I Was Gone. Thank you. Um, the first piece I'm going to read uh, is called Throwing Up in the Tent. And the book is a lyric memoir. So the pieces um, read somewhat like poetry, somewhat like prose. And it also has illustrations in it. The first real illustration in the book is a, is a watercolor by me of the fool from the tarot deck. Throwing up in the tent. <clears throat> Here at my parents' house, my father is scooting around on the living room, in the living room, on my mother's knee scooter. She's broken her foot. He asked me what I'm so busy with. I tell my father about all my projects, about this project. I tell him my friend TJ said this book was kind of bleak. My father scoffs. Isn't he the one who grew up in hellish conditions in Alaska? Hellish conditions? No, what do you mean? Didn't he tell that story about having to run the mile? Everyone has to run the mile in middle school. I had to run the mile. My father shrugs. New page. The worst fight my parents ever got into was over dried flowers or moss or maybe a half dead kitten. I can't remember exactly, but I know it was something my mother brought into the house to nurse or salvage. My father always said he never wanted seven children. I asked him why he didn't get a vasectomy and he told me he heard it was terribly painful. After the fight, they were only separated for a few days. They cried and lost weight and got on Wellbutrin and went to marriage counseling and generally annoyed the hell out of all of us. My mother was diagnosed with ADHD and my father says to this day that Ritalin saved their marriage. The only reason my mom stopped having children was because the miscarriage that resulted from her eighth pregnancy nearly killed her. The personality test says my father is motivated by fear and my mother is motivated by fun. So betwixt them both, they lick the platter clean. Here at a camping wedding in Oakland, all the women are poets, all the men work in tech and when pressed, can't tell me what they actually do for a living. I gather the gabapentin and the flutocortisone and the vitamin D from the piles of my own vomit on my tent floor and swallow them again. I think if you weren't so drunk right now, you'd be really upset, but you're numb. And that's why you can do this. I spend 20 minutes cleaning the vomit from my sleeping bag, my purse, and the tent floor. Numb, numb, numb. Vicodin and lorazepam are the only reason I made it through grad school. I'm in my parents' TV room with them and my sister Simone. Simone's just had surgery on her hand from a work injury. Somehow the conversation turns to sexual harassment in middle school. I go on and on becoming more and more angry about all the comments from boys. Boys grabbing my bra, my body, how the teachers never intervened. My mom and Simone nod and shake their heads. My dad's sitting on the stationary bicycle with the remote in his hand, staring at the floor, waiting for us to stop talking. Do you guys wanna watch the snowboarding video? He asks. Is that all you have to say? I snap. What do you mean? I'm describing all the harassment I experienced in middle school and you have nothing to say? You're my dad. I'm sorry, what do you want me to say? I don't know. I throw my hands in the air, say, I'm sorry, Martha, that you had to experience that. I wish I could have helped you, but I didn't know. I'm sorry that happened to you, says my dad robotically. I cross my arms across my chest and motion for him to start the video. After we watch a man snowboard down an insanely steep mountain slope, my dad goes on to describe the documentary about extreme snowboarding. They drop these guys out in the middle of nowhere by helicopter. This one guy describes how one time he got lost and couldn't find his way back. He was out in the woods for a week. He was eating moss and pine needles. 
My dad scrunches up his nose. He got so constipated that he had to stick his finger up his own butthole and dig his poop out. I scoff. I've had to do that so many times because of my meds. You act like it's this terrible thing. I have to do it all the time. My dad gets up and puts his hand on my shoulder. I didn't know that. I'm sorry you had to experience that, Martha. Thanks, dad. Okay, so the next piece I'm gonna read. So there's quite a few pieces in the book that are basically summaries of reality TV shows. And because I'm chronically ill, I've spent a lot of time watching reality shows, which I am a huge fan of reality TV. And then, um, so I was writing these summaries of them. And then when Trump was elected, I was realizing like, oh, I could write a lot more of these because we have like a reality TV show president, you know? So, um, so this one is about extreme weight loss. And if this was like an in-person reading, I would be like, who's watched, who's seen this show? And I might like take a poll, but um, I haven't actually read this one before to an audience. So I'm gonna read about the show, Extreme Weight Loss. <clears throat> the host leads the participant in a workout where they yell and encourage and scream at the participant. They ask the participant how bad they want it. They ask the participant who they're really mad at. They tell the participant to punch a punching bag and pretend that it's their father, their mother, their sister, their coworkers, their coach, their ex-wife, their grandparents who told them they weren't good enough or pretty enough or thin enough. The participant grimaces and sweats and cries. They fall down on the floor and can't get up. They scream and kick their legs. They trip on the treadmill and go skidding onto the floor. They say they're going to pass out and vomit. The participant vomits. The participant says they want to go home, that they can't do this, that they don't have what it takes. The host asks the participant if they want to live. They ask them if they want to die. The host tells the camera that seriously, they don't know if the participant has what it takes. The participant loses 50, 70, 90, 110 pounds in the first three months. They stand on the scale and cry and say they didn't know if they could do it that they didn't know if they had it in them. They didn't know they really wanted to live and not die. The host gives the participant tickets to see a pro football game to New Zealand. They go skydiving, horseback riding. They put on a bathing suit. Their participant is left on their own for the next 90 days. They speak into their at-home video diary. They have a cold, they have a concussion. They got fired from their job. Their father is getting out on parole. They broke up with their girlfriend. Their mother is in the hospital. They started eating ramen and mac and cheese. They can't stop vomiting. The video is grainy, a disheveled bedroom in the background. But of course the participant triumphs. They lose more than half their body weight. They get their teeth fixed. They get skin removal therapy. The host gives them a makeover. The host throws them a party. The participant grins and throws their hands in the air. The participant says they're a new person. The host gives them a year's supply of groceries from Walmart. The participant says that old fat self is dead, dead forever. It will never return. <laughs> I feel like uh, I should share the illustration. Well, it's kind of a collage and illustration on the following page. It's one of my favorites in the whole book. It says demons could be anywhere at the bottom. Such a cool book. Um, thank you both. Well, thank you all three of you for reading. Um, and I thought it'd be interesting before we talk specifically about these new books, um, to hear a little bit, uh, because Street Books is such an unusual and amazing project, um, and to hear a little bit about each one of your experiences doing like public art or creative efforts in public. Uh, in Martha's case, she's been putting out her zine Somnambulist now since 2003, uh, 35 issues or 36 issues. And um, Street Books, as Rick mentioned, was founded in 2011 by Laura. So they, it's just past your uh, 10th year anniversary. Uh, and Ben has been involved almost from the get-go as, as was clear in the reading. Um, but Ben has also done, uh, when you were living outside, as you write about in the book, 
you took it upon yourself to do various kind of public uh, beautification efforts that, uh, without spoiling things too much, I'd love for you to share a little bit about that. But specifically what I'm wondering is, can you talk a little bit about the impulse that led you to both start these things and then continue them in the, in the case of your zine, Martha, and Street Books as an organization for Ben and Laura? And this is a two-part question. Um, part two is looking back, what's one of the biggest surprises or most un unusual experiences you could share with our audience tonight? Um, so if you need reminders about both questions, just let me know. But uh, anybody want to volunteer to tackle this first? Should I just call in? I'll call in people. I'll, Laura. I'll go ahead and start. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was Great. after two, two whole years of just feeling unbelievably lousy. And somehow I just wasn't anything I did, but I got scraped off off the sidewalk and started living again and came into a shelter and then back out. And then I was here, I was the same guy, the same sidewalks, but a totally different experience and sleeping at the Chinese food joint where I had all those, that artwork up on the windows. And I don't know, I, it was the poster of the Dalai Lama. I go, oh, we got to get this place cleaned up. And the Davis Street beautification projects, all the way down to scraping the dirt out of the cracks in the sidewalk. I was real serious. I wanted to get that one block looking real nice in case his holiness happened to come walking through, which he wouldn't really. They don't have all <laughs> much consideration for the Chinese. This was in Chinatown. Um, I, I got lost here. Uh, yeah, and how that kept going? Well, actually, Tidy Man still lives today. Uh, I did a small project to see some of the uh, refuse left behind stuff and go bag it up. I, I got a project there going. Um, I'll yield the floor. I'll jump in and just say, I love that um, Hodge references the the Davis Street beautification because our the cover of our book, which I don't know if, if people can see this, but it is a beautiful art piece by the artist Aaron Miller. And it is a drawing of the kind of an approximation of the art, the impressionist artwork paintings that um, Hodge found in a free box and, and taped up. Um, and you can read the book to, to know the larger story behind that, but, um, and, and what happens. Um, but I would say to speak to your question, Michael, about starting a thing and then you know the persisting over time, I feel like Street Books was quite an, an accidental long-term. I, I mean, it's a nonprofit now, which I never would have imagined when I got a grant in 2010, late 2010, 2011 launched it. And um, it was supposed to be a three-month art project. And then I think as I ex explained in the book, um, it, you know, it was a brisk, you know, um, series of engagements, like people came every week to turn books in and check them out, check new ones out. And I realized that I could not neatly fold this up and, and leave. And so then I had to figure out what, once you've created a thing and people are relying on it, how do you keep it going? And so that first fall, I um, started, I did a Kickstarter, uh, you know, fundraiser and, and made enough to make it through the the first winter months, you know. Um, but it was a surprise to me that it continued on. And the fact that we just celebrated a decade in, in operation is, is pretty amazing because that was not how I imagined it. Um, but I do think, and I will say, it has everything to do with the numbers of people in Portland that came forward, including patrons living outdoors that were supportive of it and that were, you know. So we have incredible volunteers and staff and a board of directors that have been working for, you know, some of most people eight years or so. So it's it's a lot to do with the people um, that have supported us all this time. You wanna take it, Martha, the question? The first part of the question is just doing things at public project. And then what was the second? What's the wildest? It, did I mister that? What was the wildest thing that happened? Or something? yeah, the wildest. Um, yeah, and just the impulse. Uh, you know, when you were you were in your early twenties when you started uh, putting out your zine, and um, yeah. yeah, just kind of like if you could think back to what what led to that first issue and well, I before I was doing uh, the zine, I was doing performance poetry, 
and I got, I got real sick of doing that. And I went to the nationals and in, in Chicago that year in like 2003, I think, but, um, I think I've always wanted instant gratification. And so doing, getting like automatic feedback has always been really motivating for me. And so the zine, you know, the, the, the publishing world works so slowly, you know, sometimes. So I think having the immediate feedback and then also with the zines, it was like meeting people from all over the world, you know, it meeting in, in over, I used to have a lot of pen pals. I still have pen pals. Um, and that's just such a great tradition. And, and, and it's part of doing zines is that you're writing letters to people because the zine is almost like a letter that you're getting in the mail. So I've always really appreciated that. And then, you know, I don't know if you want to talk about this later on at some time, at some point, but, you know, the format of loners is also the format of some of my zines where I go back and forth with a friend and they write a part and I write a part. So. I mean, that's a great segue, actually, because uh, kind of my second uh, topic, second question was uh, about these, the, the uh, process for both of these books. And obviously with loners, it was co-written. Um, and sometimes when you hear about a book being co-written, often it's just, it's just one narrative, right? There, maybe there's a ghostwriter or it's two people collaborating and who knows exactly who, who wrote which section. But this is a book where it's very clear who wrote which section. Um, and uh, and then in Martha's case, um, yeah, if you could go a little bit into some of the zines that, that have been more collaborative. And also, I'd love to hear you talk, Martha, about how this book, uh, you know, with the, how this book came to be. Um, because with the full color illustrations, uh, you know, I'll let you kind of explain to those people who are not in publishing, like what, what that means financially. But yeah. yeah Feel free, all of you, to get as nerdy and as nitty gritty as, as you want to, um, because I just think that all of your work kind of comes through, even even when it's not collaborative, it's coming. There's there's this engagement with other people and um, with maybe other art artistic practices that I find really fascinating and interesting. So um, I don't know if it was two years back to back. My memory is failing me right now, but um, two issues of my zine are letters back and forth between me and a friend that's living outside of the United States. One was with a friend that was living in China, TJ, who I mentioned on the first page of my new book. Um, and then another was with a friend, David, who was living in Amsterdam. I attempted to do another series like that with some people that were living, uh, friends of mine that live abroad, but it didn't pan out. So that's always the danger of, of collaboration is that sometimes people don't really get that the project is, should be their most important thing in their whole life, you know? Um, but uh, you wanted me to talk about the process of this book too, Michael. Um, oh, I also wanted to say that I've also collaborated with illustrators. Um, even though I do illustrations, I like sometimes having other people illustrate my stories. So Katie Ellis with Brian is one person that I've collaborated with in the design of that one. This one is uh, Aaron Stanky did the cover of this one. Uh, Liz Yerby did the illustrations for both of these ones. Um, this was a collaboration between me and a nonprofit. It's called People's Guide to Portland. It, um, it's a resource guide. So um, anyway, so I've collaborated with a lot of people. It's not always writing. It's also sometimes illustration. But um, the reason I decided to self-publish this one and do a Kickstarter is because a lot of people had been telling me over the years to like do a Kickstarter. But um, I was very hesitant to do that uh, with any of my zines because I wanted to wait until I felt like I could really use that ask wisely and not just waste the ask. And so, you know, I've had, I've had I don't even know, it feels embarrassing to say a long career. It's not really, but, um, <laughs> you know, I feel like I have enough like artistic clout and like street cred to be like, I'm, you know, I'm the real deal. Like I can pull this off guys, you know. And also because I knew that this, uh, the writing style is very, is a little bit out of the norm, quite a bit out of the norm, it's a lyric memoir. And then also I wanted to do like full color illustrations and um, I knew that it was gonna be expensive. And so just the uphill battle um, of getting this published and it was just gonna be hard. And I just thought, because it's about the last four years of my life and all of our lives with the pandemic and. Trump as a president, I thought, I don't want to wait. Even if I could get this published by somebody, I don't really want to wait. And I'm also a consumer of 
a lot of like very expensive books. I like to buy like photography books. I like to buy art books. So I know that $20 for like a color printed book is something that's like a thing that people will buy. Um, but interestingly enough, um, I raised $11,000 to print this. And I also had to help with, you know, copy editing and, you know, cover design and graphic design. Um, but from the time that I got a quote from a printer to the time that I had it printed, the supply chain issue changed. It was actually $1,000 more expensive from like March to, I think it was printed in like August, maybe. I can't remember, but yeah, it went up by a thousand. So I was really lucky that I had given myself a little bit of a buffer because otherwise I wouldn't have been able to afford to do it. So I don't know if that is a good answer, but yeah. Uh, yeah, Laura uh, and, and Hodge, um, can you talk a little bit about the writing process uh, and, um, and I, I, and I will say, you know, uh, you don't have to, I already at the Portland Book Festival, I got enough credit for editing uh, loaners. So you don't have to bring me into this very much. I think, yeah, I think at the festival, Hodge got all weepy and said, this is actually Michael's book right here. We couldn't I have done it without him. Cry. All right, he didn't cry. But I will say um, it was, it was uh, such a cool collaboration with Michael and um, we, Hodge and I had been mucking around in this writing for a solid, you know, seven or eight years. And um, I think Karen in the chat alluded to a documentary that was done and it was actually by a Munich film crew. And um, they came and followed street books around and made this beautiful documentary. I'll find the link and post it. But um, one of the things that they were really stoked about was to hear that Hodge and I were working on a book and, um, the truth was we hadn't at that time been working for a solid six months or so on the book. And so when they had us act through editing the book, it was very artificial feeling and bad. And we realized we're really gonna have to get back to this. And so that kind of lit a fire under us. But I would say over the years, we talked about uh, projects we could do together, um, but we got this grant from the Regional Arts and Culture Council for a literary project. And then that, that was pretty, good motivation. We split that. We, we paid ourselves out of this little fund um, every week when we met at the Killingsworth Library. Um, Hodge, I think, composed better away from the library and brought stuff and, and would give it to me and I would sit and look at it. Um, but it, it took us a long time to assemble the pieces and, and it really was um, a, a real exercise in being able to look back and, and sort of um, reassemble time um, and incidents in time. And I remember at, at my most despairing, I thought it's impossible to piece together both my life and Hodges in a, narr in a through narrative line. And that's when the, um, the fragment form um, felt really good, like the back and forth, because um, you know it, it told a larger yeah. story, even though it was in small bits, you know, so. Hodge, do you want to speak to that? I can inject a quick comment here. Uh, we actually got started, I think it was 2014, because I wasn't really close to the library. I was working at the cemetery. But that's what we started with, just that Street Roots article. We had, we both had writing. And, and when Laura would come over and go through the notes and actually assemble it into a real article with I didn't know you could actually do that. I just wrote notes and stuff. And Laura made a whole article, Street Roots is a, a outdoorsman's newspaper in Portland. Uh, they put out a little magazine weekly and uh, we did an article for him. And it was while we were doing that, that she sent me a text message. What do you think, should we write a book? And I texted her back saying, have your people call my people, we'll do lunch love your hair baby don't change a thing i'm hollywood through and through and that's what actually where we got it started and uh i guess we can go on to the next thing now well i think what's so what's so cool is it it sounds like i i, I know laura you must have written a few sections really early on uh you know those that capturing that first summer on your own um, and, 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 but they, 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 they must've been kind of in the, 
in these short snippets that they're somewhat similar to what appear in the final version of the book. Um, is that, you're nodding. Yeah, and I yeah. would also just say that was also the danger of that because sometimes some of those stories had sort of been told that so often, you know, that they were sort of shellacked almost and yeah. it didn't feel live anymore. And so when assembling the book, Hodge and I would sit down with that first 30 pages over and over again. And I think that that we needed to break through and sort of tell the middle and later sections, but we were still living it. And so that it was this moving target of a, of a finish. And that was an ongoing challenge as well. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I just, I just do think that there's something in the quality of the writing from both of you, it, the, the feeling of being in conversation without directly being in conversation with the sections around that, that it's just, you know, it's just, it's, it's both entertaining and fun and also just fascinating. Um, you know, which must come out of just the fact that you were wrestling with these pages for so long. Um, so I, I want to move on to a sort of another, a more nerdy process question about writing, where all three of you, uh, you know, you have this ability to uh, recount an encounter with somebody or like a, a overheard snippets of dialogue um, that are often funny, sometimes like disturbing. Um, the, but the, these are moments that on the surface may, might not be all that memorable sometimes, but you all like you get the work done and your your writing is uh, in my in my opinion, there's this there's a special quality of reading about someone's daily experiences just out on the street, for example, um, interacting with others um, that like. I, I, what I'm, this is a long-winded way of asking for you to talk about how you take, let's say, Martha, like, uh, for example, you're reading uh, about your, this conversation with your dad, like, when did you write that? Like, how, how much time elapsed before you're like, I need to put this down? And kind of the same question, but with different people um, in, in Laura and Ben's experiences. Like, what, what does that look like? Like, how much, how quickly do you kind of get to the page? Let's start with Martha. I can't answer that question now. I mean, you just said that I have this great memory, but I can't remember how I actually wrote down that conversation with my dad. But I will say that um, I'm someone that comes from a very large family. And if, you know, a lot of people have like um, issues with like public speaking and stuff, which I have a little bit, but not too bad. Because, you know, if you're around the dinner table with our family, it's public speaking if you want to tell a story. And also it better be a pretty good story because otherwise you're not going to, you're making 15 people stop what they're doing and listen to you, it better be a freaking good story. Huh. You know, so I've been surrounded by good storytellers my whole life. And so if I, you know, for, for example, the story with my dad, it's like, I, that happened. And then I thought about it. And then I thought, oh my God, this is hysterical. I have to tell my sister. So I tell my sister. And then I thought, okay, I want to, I want to write this down. And so at that point, I write down how long that, what, that whole process was. I don't know. I couldn't tell you. But I do know that like just being around people that are good storytellers is going to make you a better storyteller. And I have very little patience for what most people have as dinner time conversations when I've gone to other people's homes. I find it just, just jaw dropping, you know, what people will listen to. I don't know it because I'm, <laughs> I'm from a family of like mostly everyone has ADD and there's like 25 of us so I guess that's how I can answer that question. It's funny I remember just years of um, street book shifts where I would ride my bike home and I was convinced that it was it would be impossible to capture what I had just experienced I just knew it didn't matter how fast I mean, I had maybe taken some notes in the moment. Sometimes there were too many things going on to, to write it all down. And I write a little bit about this, like Hodge telling me some great story or quoting something and it already turning to vapor before I could even get to something to write it down. And, and I remember um, over time talking to my little core family or my parents and having my dad say, you're writing this down, right? You know, um, because I feel like those stories, you know, came into being and were there sort of for the 
plucking if I just tracked it and if I just was organized enough. Um, and I think Hodge and I, you know, we have a text thread, we have an email thread that goes back years and then postal correspondence sometimes. And he, you know, just gave me a weird um, happy Guy Fox day piece of writing recently. You know, so it goes on and on, but, um, but yeah, capturing the weirdest stuff was a challenge sometimes and also so rewarding to, you know, to make sure it got to the page. I don't know, do you wanna to speak to that, Hodge? Well, I wish I had written more stuff down when I was driving the cab. Actually, my cab stories are still among the best. Maybe I'll do that, get a few of them down. Uh, well, yeah, you sure got a story to tell if you're living on a doggone sidewalk there. Uh, writing it down, aye, aye, aye. Uh, oh, I don't know. Uh, what's the question? Michael would give you a fresh one. Yeah, maybe um, I, I, I'm wondering, this is more for uh, Laura, you're, you're welcome to chime in as, as uh, if, if you if you want to, but uh, both uh, Martha and Hodge, you, you write about um, living with mental illness and uh, sometimes in ways that that can be pretty funny. Like you look at something that uh, that that can be a, a debilitating thing for so many people, and uh, you make it accessible. I think for readers and um, how what what goes what goes into play when you're being that vulnerable on the page about your own experiences, and how does that maybe compare to writing about other people? Um, that that maybe are suffering in similar ways and, and the responsibilities you might feel towards towards them and their stories. I'll let go. Yeah, I'll let Hodge go first. Keegan said that she said briefly in the documentary that the Germans shot, she said depression is the biggest problem out here. It's just you see it everywhere. And you know, it's just devastating. And other mental illness, well, this whole thing is bigger than the both of me. Uh -huh. Uh, tough way to go. Try and laugh it off, I guess. Uh, go ahead. Doug. Okay, my dog's barking, but I'll just go with it. Um, well, I, I mean, that's a huge question, I think. And um, I think it took me a long time to kind of just accept that I'm mentally ill. I mean, I kind of just say that all the time, you know. And I still use the word crazy as um, an insult, which I think is pretty hypocritical, but I am a crazy person. I've, I've come to realize that you basically can't have your adrenals taken out and not get just totally out of whack. Um, and I've probably been out of whack my whole life. Um, and so there is something similar in me and Hodge's story where it's like, it gives you that freedom, you know, it's not like either of us are a millionaire with everything we've ever wanted and still can't seem to get it together. You know, you go through like a really hard time and you just realize like, why do I care? You know, like why, am, what am I protecting? You know? Um, and I hope that helps other people. I think, you know, culturally we're going through like a, a time period now where people are way more open about their struggles and I don't see there's any reason to be uh, hiding it or ashamed of it or anything like that. Um, but for me, it was just like, this is, if I'm going to be talking about my life, then like the elephant in the room is that like, I deal with a ton of mental health issues. So <clears throat> yeah, that's what's going on with me. I'm going to write about it. So does that resonate with you, Hot? Uh Actually, no, not writing about it. I want to just be funny. <laughs> oh, I ever want to be able to tell funny stories. My cab stories are much, much better. Trust me. <laughs> but I think it's interesting because I think, you know, for Hodge, for all Hodge's saying, you know, he's disinclined to focus on the writing of them. It's the idea that I think he did such an amazing job at capturing in this very spare kind of distilled quality what it feels like to be walking along and not be right and be and recognize that something is distinctly off and you have to function in this world um, and and 
it's incredibly challenging. And I think with street books and all of our library shifts, we have seen so many people over the years and maybe more now than ever who are really struggling with mental health and they are more vulnerable than ever being just outside, sometimes walking around in stocking feet in Old Town, you know? So it's really striking. And I, I, I find both Martha's writing and Hodge's just like that level of vulner, vulnerability and the willingness to just stay, you know, speak straight uh, is really, I think it's a, it's a pretty powerful thing, especially for other people to encounter who can really relate, you know? Um, I thank you so much for, for answering that question. I know it's a big, a big question. Um, I'm looking at, uh, a little ways back up in the chat and Karen was wondering, uh, with street books being founded in 2011, how have things changed in Portland since then? And can you tell us about some of the people, some of the, the other people involved with street books? Yeah, I would just, I would start and just say that, um, I think whatever we thought was sort of a, a, you know, high number of people living outdoors and an alarming situation in 2011, um, the pandemic is sort of blown open. And I know Seattle is um, struggling with the same, West Coast cities all up and down um, are facing the same challenges. And I would say um, since we began, we um, have seen a real uptick in folks um, being outside, but also when the pandemic hit and public spaces were closed, the reality of that was any day rooms, any community centers, any public libraries where someone had gone to charge a phone or check an email account, um, any, anything like that went away. And so in Portland, it's still that way. Even the social service agencies where people used to be able to sit down inside and just eat one meal seated um, you know, in a, sort of convivial place, or at least a you know place with other people, um, those are all gone still. And so the reality of that is an exposure to the elements and just an outsideness um, that's, been, that's really uh, profound. So I would say that's a difference now. There were these, there was a kind of fabric that is more frayed now a decade later than it was when we launched in, in 2011, for sure. And I, I mean, the, the shadow side of that is this uptick in mutual aid organizations and activism and support at a very grassroots level. So there is that also happening. Maybe Hodge, do you wanna tackle the second part of that question or feel free to, to add uh, to how you've seen Portland change over the last decade, but also um, other folks who are involved in street books, if you wanna give a, a sense of the, the, the size of the organization and some of the other uh, volunteers, board members, and librarians? Uh, actually, Laura's better than that. She knows everybody better, but uh, yeah, there's a whole, a whole platoon, a squadron, I don't know, of people that joined up with street books and more that are happy to volunteer. A literacy project, who's, who's against that? You know, no, <laughs> don't read, it's subversive. <laughs> uh, it justifies itself. You don't need to. Uh, but to go back to how things have changed from when I was out there, it was, I don't know, our numbers. Are, for one thing, the tents, they didn't, nobody used tents. As you're on the sidewalk and <clears throat> that was it. Now that I guess the city has decided tents are cool, but mm -hmm. the numbers have swelled substantially. And all over town to the freeway ramps that's ah oh, it's just everywhere it's yeah. like the whole world has turned into one big refugee camp and yeah. you mentioned the tidy man project earlier and which you write about in the book but could you just say a little bit more so people have a sense of what it is that 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 entails bagging up the trash and if you're creative about it, you don't just bag up trash, you look through it, you can salvage all kind of interesting things. But the way I did it, I was just out on the fruit. I just got sick of looking at it. I like crud on the uh, beside of where the, where the max line runs along I-84 into town. And the slope down there was just littered with junk. And this, I guess it was a the opposite of a turf war between city and the city and and the railroad, they both blamed it on, it's your property and 
neither one of them took care of it. And I just got sick of looking at it. I said, never mind, I'll do it myself. I just went down there and spent, oh, I don't know how many hours, but it certainly looked different. Uh, I haven't been out there for a long time, mm -hmm. but you know, how many people do that? I got another one by an encampment down at the, oh boy, there's people that moved out long ago and left everything behind and there's plenty to pick up and I'm still not through with that place. So I'll get back there when I do. Well, I've seen a couple uh, questions pop up, including one from uh, Lauren, a former student of mine. Hi, Lauren. Um, what are the favorite books lent out from Street Books? I liked it when Candide got checked back in and checked back out on the same day. You know, Candide. the best of all possible worlds. The irony was not lost on me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah, I think... You know, we have um, we've definitely lured customers in who thought they didn't want anything to do with books by showing them that we had Louis L'Amour Westerns um, and um, James Patterson. Some of the the um, murder mystery books have been really popular. Um, there's a guy um, that I always think of and wonder where he is now that loved Margaret Atwood. So he would come back. He took the, the robber bride one time and then came back asking for more of her. And it's so, it's interesting to try to pinpoint a favorite because it's over time, it's been so incredibly diverse and it's interesting what people are drawn to and what they'll, what they'll request. And I write about being surprised, thinking I'm approaching in a very open-minded way. And, and, that, and yet when a patron has said, I, I've really been meaning to read Charles Frazier, you know, uh, I, do a little bit of a double take and realize, okay, I, I made assumptions about this guy, you know? So that's been interesting too. There are tons of, of favorites, you know? Mm. Uh, and then another question, uh, writing about your own life and people you know seems a little scary. I'm curious how Laura and Ben approached that as first time authors and how Martha's approach may have changed over the years. Um, and Martha, this being your third book, it seems like you put a book out every five years. So every five years you have this, uh, this chance to reconsider. <laughs> um, but so yeah, maybe we'll start with, with you and then, and, and then have Laura and Ben address that. Well, I tend to um, just predict what people are gonna have a problem with and um, you know, pass it by people like my parents. I passed by you know, everything in the book by them. But um, you, know, you just do the best you can because Sometimes people, you never know what people are going to have an issue with. Sometimes it's like, you know, you write all about them and the thing that they focus on is something that you never thought they would. Um, but I do think that as I have become more well-known and my books have been more widely read, I think my family's a little bit more like, you know, I'm just going to take my uh, last scene, for example. I, I published it. I sent it to my subscribers, which include a lot, like over a hundred people. And then um, I thought my family was cool and they, they, they weren't cool with some of the stuff that was in there. So I had to go back and edit it. And, you know, it, it's, I, I don't know, on one hand, you'd think I'd be better at it, but I, I don't know. I just, I do the best I can, but I do think that uh, if you are scared of what people are going to think of you or your family or what your family is going to think of you or friends or whatever, then like you, you shouldn't write memoir. You should just write a novel and pretend that it's um, fiction or something, you know? So, because <laughs> at some level you wouldn't still be doing it if you cared like that much, you know? So. Well, and what the, so Martha's most, is it still your best selling zine, The Family Meeting Minutes? Yes. Yeah. So that was your 15th zine, maybe 2009, 2008? Yeah, it was 2009 or 10. Uh, because the year I had to move back in with my parents when I got really sick was 2008 and 2009 during the recession. And like five of my siblings were living with my parents as adults and teenagers. And every Sunday, my dad would make us have a Sunday family meeting. And I started taking the meeting minutes after the first meeting that I had to go to because I thought this is freaking hysterical. And then I would post it online and then it would go into a zine. And it is still that one and the PI zine, which I'm not doing oh, yeah. more because it's in the second book. Those yeah. are probably my two most popular zines. Yeah. 
but at that point the the jig was up like <laughs> like your family knew that everything was fair game i mean it's so great i mean the family well, meeting i try not so to great. i try not to think like everything's fair game but like okay <laughs> if something that's super funny and i write it down then like if i'm doing my due diligence i should really like pass it by them before i put it out in the world yeah which i'm not always great at but i try my best uh so if people want that uh martha's first memoir is called one more for the people and it has the entirety of the family meeting minutes in it um so that uh that can be found at perfectdaybooks.com um laura and ben do you want to tackle that question let me take cuts ahead of laura because it's real quick i wasn't <laughs> sure if i should put my grandchildren in there and yeah. i was right i shouldn't have they filed a lawsuit they want their share of the revenue <laughs> Mercenaries through and through. Go ahead. I'm done. Uh, Go ahead, Laura. I was just gonna say, uh, I I was at Hodges today, and we were kind of, you know, we did a reading practice, and we have our weekly cowboy shows that we watch. And um, he pulled out uh, Tim O'Brien, the things they carried, and we were just talking about that blurring that O'Brien does between, you know, factual truth and a more emotional truth that that may be truer on some level to the story you're trying to tell. And I think Hodge and I changed names of some patrons and some people that, that may have not wanted to be um, listed, uh, you know, that we could no longer contact anymore and just felt like out of deference, we really needed to take care um, in telling stories that involved other people. But I also think that um, if, if the question is kind of like, how was it to write personally? I feel like I personally, I've written for some time nonfiction, but I feel most comfortable telling other people's stories. And so this may be the first time that I was an active participant and had to mm -hmm. kind of talk about myself. So that was a, that was a challenge just to, um, you know, include myself. And I think my partner, Ben Parzibach, who's a writer, looked at early drafts and said, this is great, but where are you in this? You know, and, and, and that is a tendency, I think, to set up a bunch of barricades and just, you know, yield the floor. So I don't know if you want to add anything, Hodge, about telling your own story. I think it was a pretty cool thing that you um, included your grandkids and your niece and that there were no real lawsuits. I have to amend the record. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, another question came uh how do you pick the books for street books uh pointing out that it's challenging uh to bring you know you can't bring an entire uh building with you as a, a mobile library so yeah you know i have to say it's hilarious because everyone's tastes run very differently and so hodge's library shift might look quite different from mine and he's known for being able to check out the most preposterous titles that no one thinks will go out. It's just his like winning salespersonship, I guess. Um, but I think early on, we decided to do our very best to compile the most diverse titles we could so that everyone would see themselves reflected in the collections that we offered. Um, and so it's been really cool. We've, we've been able to work with writers and poets, the, the poet Ed Edmo, who's a Shoshone Bannock storyteller, has a collection of poetry that we've been buying and putting out. And he lived outdoors for like 12 years along mm -hmm. Burnside. And so there's a lot of resonance to putting his words back out now that he's in, you know, shelter, he's in a house. But uh, it's pretty cool to, to be able to pull from talent here in Portland and the Northwest, you know. We have a lot of local writers that make the shift. A couple of real quick ones, oddball checkouts. A guy, I had, will the real Millard Fillmore please stand up? There's everything that you wanted to know about Millard Fillmore and more. And one guy came by, he's like the only Millard Fillmore aficionado in, in Oregon. And he just had to have that. Uh, the arms of Krupp the armament manufacturers, crop big cannons and things. And a guy came by and he knew all about their whole story, how they used to operate over the centuries. They've been around for a long, long time. 
<laughs> they had a real racket going. They'd work the balance of power. They'd sell 15 inch guns to England and ships that could withstand 18 inch guns to a totally uninvolved country and just shuffle things around just to keep the uh, keep the guns selling. Uh, yeah, oddball checkouts, juicing for life. They're good recipes, but if you don't have a blender, <laughs> what are you gonna do with it? But somebody wanted it, so you just never know. Great. Um, well, do we have any other questions in the chat? Uh, this is this is your last chance to to get that question answered with all of us together in one virtual space. Or do uh, you three authors have any questions that you want to ask one another or, or or final thoughts before we sign off? What's it all about? Why are we here? <laughs> That's the question. Okay, uh, who wants to tackle that one? <laughs> I'm gonna pass on that one, but that is an important question. <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty heady one. I would say, what's it all about? Um, I would use that as a way to come back around and thank people for tuning in to this mm -hmm. sort of weird portal. And and just, if, you know, here we still are after all this time when we, I think we felt like July was it, we were gonna be home free after that and life would be different. and. So it's this continued adaptation. And I just think it's, you know, Hodge and I write a lot about the, the folks in Portland living outdoors who have built resilience in the face of having very little. Uh, but I think this is a larger struggle for all, you know, all people, some, some of whom are in homes and some are out, just in making sense of, of um, what's happening and also just ways to make connections um, you know, and this is this is a good this is a good example of a gathering space. So I would just throw out a huge gratitude for people who registered and came, you know, to this little talk. Me too. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you, Michael. And thank you, Laura. Thank you, Hodge. Thank you, Elliot Bay Books. Um, it's been great to be part of this conversation. And everyone that's listening, this is such a good book. Like you really need to read it. It is amazing and it will make you laugh. It will make you cry. And it's just, and if you love books, then you will love this book. I would say the Martha. same about Martha. <laughs> Martha's and getting I will say thanks to everyone. Thank you for your interest and thank you for being here. Yeah. And one thing uh, that didn't come up is at the very, very back of Loaders, there is a guide to creating your own, starting your own street library, the last few pages kind of outline like the, the major things to consider and, and uh, the work that you, you might, might want to put in before, or, or I, I, I have no longer articulate. I've been staring at the screen for an hour and, and my brain no longer works. But um, all this to say that at the Portland Book Festival last weekend, I think it was Hodge who said that uh, if, if loners, if all that happens with loners is that a new street library is created in another city, um, that would be amazing and a, such a beautiful thing. And there is right now one sister library in Austin, Texas, um, but Seattle seems like a natural, a extremely natural uh, uh, companion uh, sister city for a street library. So those of you tuning in from Seattle, um, you have the, uh, a wealth of knowledge uh, at the Street Books team, not just Laura and Ben, um, but uh, if anybody has that flicker of, of inspiration, like they want to help you. So keep that in mind if, if, it's, a, if it's a kind of project that you feel like you have the wherewithal to take on or, um, or if you don't, uh, just talk about it and share the book. But thank you again for, for tuning in. It's been really lovely uh, chatting with, with these three amazing writers and there's Rick. Rick is just glad to say um, thank you all and um, great ideas. Um, I don't know if we would have had a Millard Fillmore partisan up here or not. Um, although I do know somebody once who wanted to read biographies of every president. And I, I remember when there was a biography of Millard Fillmore and got to tell him that. Um, this has been wonderful. And yes, I hope someone in Seattle picks up the thread of 
of a street library because it certainly could be used and needed here. And yes, um, to what Laura just said too about um, keeping connected in, in ways that we all have had to and are. Um, we've been now doing these for almost a year and a half, these um, in lieu of in-person programs. And we have done the in-person for over 30 years. And just that's been such a part of the heartbeat of what we do in the bookstore. And it feels like in our part of the city, this is its own way of doing it, I guess. And it's, it's, but it is amazing too, because we make connections that go farther afield than Seattle and Portland and other places. And so it's just have to gather it differently and, and know that when our screens click off, it's still there. Um, and it's there in the spirit of the books, both Martha's memoir, this one, and the, her previous books, and um, this beautifully made book too, which I don't know, think got things got said with little flaps, the French flaps as they call them. Um, anyway, that, it, it's a marvelous and wonderful thing that has been done, things that have been done with um, both books and all three of you authors and you editor, publisher, and um, conspirator with um, these three, Michael. Um, and you've also done a wonderful job of, of you know, running this program and, and bringing everyone to it, both the audience and um, the writers with each other. Um, so thank you again, everyone. And um, come see us up in Seattle, come get these books here when, when you're up here. And we'll, um, glad to know you, I think everyone was just at the festival in Portland down there. So there's some mix of in-person and, and the virtual as the virtual continues. So thank you all take care and um, be well and warm and everything else and read, read good books. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.